According to a new report, BAME millennials have less stable working lives than their white peers. And the figures are staggering. People of colour in Britain are 58% more likely to be unemployed and 47% more likely to be on zero hours contracts. These figures hold even when you bring in other factors that may have an influence like gender, family background or qualifications. Meanwhile, those in unstable employment are more likely to suffer from poor mental health, which means, as Simon Woolley from Operation Black Vote says, it's a double hit if you're from a BAME community. When we talk about structural racism, this is exactly what it looks like. It's why British citizens from minority ethnic backgrounds have to send, on average, 60% more job applications to get a positive response. It's why some British universities are reportedly oblivious to the scale of racial harassment on campuses. We like to think that discrimination automatically vanishes, that people catch tolerance by osmosis as society moves forward and social attitudes change. But as the report on BAME millennials shows, that is a misguided assumption. Nothing changes unless we all work to make it change. Yeah, um, I agree with you on, on that. I mean, what you said about uh, the need to send more applications if you're from an ethnic minority, that is painful. And I just want to tell a personal story, which isn't necessarily proof of racism, but it, it shows you the level of competition there is out there. When I applied to university, I applied to five unis, I, well, I actually had already completed my maths A level and got an A, and I was predicted three more A's. So I was predicted four, I had four, four A levels, A, coming at me, and I got five rejections rejected by every single union. That's the level of competition. Now, the surname Smith will never give an employer pause for th thought. The surname um, Khan, Mohammed, um, Oluwole, that might. And if you're dealing with that level of competition, the slightest pause for thought is going to make a massive difference. And that's one of the reasons why you're going to see massive disparities in terms of the number of applications that people need to send out. Mm. How is it to be tackled? What do you think? Because you've laid yeah. out very very cogently the problems, mm -hmm. and that is appalling if somebody with a, a last name such as yours, I mean, that, that's unconscionable. So how is it to be beaten? Yeah, that is actually the case. There was a, um, a report a year ago, I think it was, that actually sent out uh, CVs and just changed the name. Nothing else was changed. And I think, you know, somebody called Adam something like three or four times more likely to get an interview than... So how do we alter it? What do we... I mean, there it's must be laws against that. There are laws against it. There's race, race yeah. discrimination, that, but, but Obviously, it doesn't it. work. Yeah, yeah. You try proving it. And I think it's a really good question. It's something that organizations are looking at constantly, you know, racial equality, think tanks, etc. Um, you can have name blind recruitment, so you erase the names from the recruitment process. Oh, okay. Uh, so you, you still know male, 22, went to Oxford, yada yada, but you have no idea of the name, is that You have no it? idea right, of the name, okay. you have no idea what they look like. Okay. Um, mm. Some people are suggesting. Uh, so Simon Woolley from Operation Black Vote, who was involved in this latest report, uh, has suggested that you, uh, the, the government puts out a, a race pay audit, so in the same way that you have one for the gender pay gap, you'd have one for the race pay gap. Um, but it is, it's obvious, what's clear from this latest report is that it's obvious that it affects people at every stage. So it's from recruitment through whether or right. not you get a promotion, through to whether, you know, there are people of colour sitting at board level. So right the way through, it's something that, you know, structurally uh, needs to be challenged and addressed. Yeah, a long time ago, I, I produced a report that was called No Bloody Suntans, right, which was basically the expression, and I, it was based upon a long interview I did with somebody who ran an employment agency, it's saying horrible. no bloody suntans, which was one of the phases people used to say they didn't want ethnic minorities oh, wow. when they phoned them up. Now, I think when that, was that? The, oh, this must be 30 years Thank ago, Thank God right? for that. Now, that, I think, is, that I think has changed. <laughs> that, so I think, nice. has changed. I think it is nothing as blatant as that anymore. But I do think the figures show that there is still a big issue. Mm -hmm. You tried to tackle this at the BBC, famously. What year, how many years ago was that? Oh, that must be getting on. That's nearly 20 years ago. Rem remind uh, the uh, viewers what you did. Well, I got interviewed in a, in a, in a radio programme, and I said that I... I thought that the BBC was hideously white. And uh, you, you cannot believe the attacks I got. I mean, the Daily Telegraph and the, I'm just came in at me, which you wouldn't get today. It's interesting, you wouldn't get it if you said that today, because everybody recognises the problem. 
We and then, why did they attack you? Oh, just because they said, well, it's we're in it. You know, that old, that old Daily Telegraph reader view of the world, which was, you know, well, this is England, we're a white country and all that stuff. Mm. They wouldn't do that now. That's the, the world has changed. But what we try to do at the BBC, and I think companies could do, is we, you've got to know the stats. You've got to know who of your employees come from where and what their background is, what their colour is. You've got to know that. And then we put in the thing and said, OK, we're now going to question, we're now going to hold heads of departments responsible for getting more people from ethnic minorities into their, uh, into their departments. Once you do that, miracle of miracles, it happens. Because their, their bonuses are in question. There, but we and we then had a kangaroo court. We mm. then used to get them in every three months and say, "Look, your numbers haven't got any better. What are you going to do about it?" And actually, they did get better. I think it's important to get um, uh, some some examples in. The way my hair is now, I wouldn't want to wear this for an interview unless I absolutely had to, because I would think that that would play play a part in me not getting the job because my hair is not European slick straight, or it's not conservative enough. Femi, do you think that's true? That, um, that she has to change her hair, or do you think that's her own perception of it? There will be an element of that. Um, I mean, like I said, if you that level of prejudice just does exist. I mean, I remember as a, as a kid, uh, my three, my, two of my friends, um, both of them were white, and we were sat in the playground waiting to get let into lunch. And there was a teacher stood, stood letting people into lunch, and we thought, let's just do a, um, a, a little test. And so they untucked their shirts, undid their blazers, um, un und undid the top button, pulled down their ties. And I just had one top button undone. And we single filed past the teacher to see which one would be get stopped. It was me. Yeah. Is that why you wear T-shirts like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rachel, I don't think anyone um, can argue or dispute those facts. And I think it's a shame because I think businesses should want to be more diverse because when you're diverse, you're not only representing your customers, but you've got different voices and perspectives and experiences, which I think is welcomed in business. And I think to your point, anonymised um, applications, they can be a very good thing. I wouldn't even go as far as saying that you're male or you're 50. I would actually argue that your age, your gender, and your name, etc. In many you cases, can't have someone's age. No, I'm just saying that actually it's kind of irrelevant. You, you can't. You and, can't and, have someone's age. Not and now. what you do, I used to run employment um, roadshows, and what people you say when it comes to age, you'd get older people saying that they were discriminated right. against because of their age. Then you'd right. get younger people saying that they weren't getting opportunities because mm. of their lack of experience. Right, actually, I'm running a cocktail bar. Right? Yeah. And I want my staff on roller skates. I want hunky-looking young men and, hun and great-looking young women racing around on roller skates. I'm not going to employ me. So how do I make sure so I don't interview me? You probably wouldn't apply for that. No, no but they might. Well, I don't know. How they probably would. Probably probably <laughs> but how would. does that work? That is a certain look I want for my cocktail bar. That's why these kids racing around on roller skates. And I've got, and I've got me turning up. Yes, it's madness. And no, it's not only you turning up, but we've got to interview you for half an hour, because otherwise you yeah. seem to be Oh, rude. that's absurd. We, it happens all the time that you see, you know you're not going to give somebody a job after five minutes, yeah. don't you, a lot of the time. And other, but that, but that, and, and the danger is that that could be because of race, if you're not careful. But if you had your way, you'd have people submitting a picture no, I with a CV. No, no, He's all right. He's quite fit. He no, I would not. Yeah, if I'm running yeah. my cocktail bar, I should be able to choose the people that show the look of the, of the bar or the restaurant or whatever it well, is. Well, all I'll say to you is I hope you never apply for a job. Have you ever seen me on roller skates? Have you ever seen me on roller skates? I've got to be honest, key. I haven't. I think I can live without that image. <laughs> no, anyway, <laughs> you're watching The Pledge on Sky News. And coming up, why there should be nothing controversial about protecting victims of domestic abuse.